For Krima Media's policy, I'm Tabi Madiba. Journalist and author Jonathan Ansa joins me to discuss his book titled Betrayal, The Secret Lives of Apartheid Spies. Briefly talk to us about the process of writing this book and why are you so interested in spies? I'm interested in spies accidentally um, and that was because um, after I wrote the first book about Craig Williamson, um, after my interview with him, I remember watching him walk, walk away and um, it occurred to me that you know all these other spies have just kind of walked away and uh, I, I wondered what had happened to them. So I decided to go on a quest to find them, to track them down, see what had become of them and whether, you know, how they reflected on what they had done 25 years ago or even longer. Some, some spies I tracked down kind of worked in the 60s some spies I write about worked in the 50s. So that's, uh, what, 70 years ago. So just trying to understand what motivated them to do what they did and whether they have regrets about what they did and whether they feel that um, they betrayed people and what they think about that all these years later. Your book, Betrayal, includes more information about Craig Williamson. Is this a continuation from your previous book, Uncovering Craig Williamson, published in 2017? So the, the book really is a kind of a sequel to that book. Mm -hmm. um, but so each chapter represents a different spy. Um, and I tried to do it chronologically, so the first one would be um, Dieter Gerhardt, um, who's kind of one of the most enigmatic spies in, in this country's history. But, and the chapter on Craig Williamson really is a, a response to the book, and we have quite an awkward meeting after the book was, w was written, um, the first book, and, and um, it's, it's about that meeting that we had, um, what we talked about. It was a very bizarre setting. We met in this hunter's guest lodge, and uh, there were all sorts of dead animals on the walls. It was a huge room that we met in. And I just had this, uh, this feeling of being looked at by lots and lots of eyes on the, you know, looking, looking at me from the wall. Um, and re really trying to understand what had happened. Dietrich Gerhardt was famous for spying for the Soviet Union while working for apartheid South Africa's Navy. What impact did his spying have on Cold War dynamics and why was he ultimately exposed? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, the impact that he had on the Cold War was enormous. He, he actually, I mean, you know, at the time when he was exposed, um, one of the headlines was sort of the most famous Cold War spy has been exposed um, and it's true I mean he spied for Russia for, for 20 years before he was exposed. What led to his exposure was uh, what kind of often leads to spies exposure is that um, a spy in Russia defected to America um, and uh, they worked out that there was a leak coming from somewhere and they went and they tried to pin down where the leak was coming from. They had uh, a number of, uh, of suspects and then they eventually uh, worked out through quite a good detective work where the, where the leak was and they set a trap for him and they arrested him in America in 1983. So he, and he started spying in 1962-63. So one of the world's most successful spies, certainly one of South Africa's probably South Africa's most accomplished spy, but of course I have to say that we know about, because many spies haven't been exposed. And, um, but I do think that if anybody um, had spied longer than Dieter, um, it would be quite astonishing. Garrett Ludi betrayed his then lover, Tony Benstein, in order to get into the South African Communist Party. Tell us more about this episode. Yes, um, so uh, Tony's parents w were really famous veterans of the South African Communist Party, Hilda and Rusty Bernstein. And um, Gerard Ludi had uh, kind of infiltrated um, the Congress of Democrats. It was a, f uh, you know, he was looking for a way into the South African Communist Party and you, you, you couldn't just find it, it was a banned underground organization. So you had to kind of be propositioned 
and nominated to, to join. And um, so he, 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 he and uh, Tony started dating and um, that was his way in, you know, eventually, not his only way in, but, but, but it was a way to, to kind of meet Hilda and Rusty. And it's probably them that uh, nom some other people nominated him, but he, they probably vouched for him. And he ended up sending people to prison. When testifying at the Zondo Commission of Inquiry into State Capture in June, former President Jacob Zuma accused his three comrades of being apartheid spies and agents. What are your thoughts about this? It's an impossible accusation because, you know, if, if you, you it, it's almost like saying, you know, somebody's a racist. Um, you can't prove it or disprove it. And once you start to try and reject it, you just sound guilty. Um, but uh, I believe that what you know, uh, the former president was doing was a distraction, that he was uh, trying to create a, a, a political sleight of hand. Um, and also the people that he accused of being spies were all people that were in his cabinet and, and, and are his political enemies. So, um, I, you know, Proving if somebody's a spy is, is, is very, very difficult. There's no paperwork, there's no paper trail. You know, it's, it's not like uh, um, there's a list of spies that the, the police have kept and that we can go and, uh, you know, tick your name off. All of those documents have been shredded and there's kind of, in a way, there's this, um, I don't know, you know, this honor amongst these uh, this establishment, for want of a better word, that they won't reveal or divulge the names of people who worked for them. So to find out who were spies is almost impossible, unless somebody confesses or is unmasked in a way. And I, I think, um, you know, pointing fingers at somebody and saying he was a spy is uh, disingenuous at the best, unless you come with actual proof. In some ways, it is strange that you include Roland Hunter in your book as he was an anti-apartheid spy, revealing secrets of the apartheid government to assist the ANC. Tell us more about what Roland Hunter did and how he worked with Derek Hanukum and his wife Trisha in the anti-apartheid struggle. So, yeah, I mean, the, the title of the book is The Secret Lives of Apartheid Spies Betrayal. Um, and apartheid, in the sense, is during the apartheid era. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, Roland Hunter was working against apartheid, as was Derek and also Trish, um, as was Dieter Gearhart and um, there's another uh, person I profile, a woman from Kimberley called Jennifer Miles, who was ostensibly spying for the Cubans. So it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's not necessarily all the people who were uh, um, spying for the apartheid state, it, it, it were people who were spying during the apartheid era, so on both sides of the apartheid divide. But Roland, um, I, I, in the book, I call him an accidental spy because he didn't want to be a spy. In fact, if he had a choice, he would have you know, tried not to be a spy. But he was a conscript, and at that time in South Africa, white men were conscripted into the army. So he had no choice other than to go to jail or to go into exile, um, but to go into the South African Defence Force. And he went into the, the Defence Force, he did his basic training, and he ended up fortuitously in um, military intelligence being deployed to or being sent to um, military intelligence and while he was there as a kind of an, an administrative person he happened to discover all sorts of information about that South Africa was responsible for destabilizing the frontline states Mozambique, Zimbabwe and um, was it Lesotho and um, he felt that he had a duty to get this information out. So he, at that point, he, he wasn't a member of the ANC a, a, and, and he didn't uh, kind of know that he would give that information to the ANC. He just wanted to get it out. He felt it was his duty to expose the fact that South Africa was destabilizing these countries. Um, and so he, 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 through some various connections of his, he got uh, connected to the Hanukoms. And the Hanukoms were, they had a farm in Michalisburg and they were trying to recruit people into the ANC. And so he went to that farm, he eventually told the Hanukoms what he was doing, and they put him in touch with the ANC in exile in Botswana. 
and he went off into Botswana and he told the ANC what he had uncovered. And for a year, he smuggled information out of military intelligence. He was eventually caught. And lastly, do you think there can ever be forgiveness to spies who betrayed other people? It's a, a, a difficult question to answer because I can't answer on behalf of the people who were betrayed. But when I spoke to them, um, they felt that you know, forgiveness must come with telling the truth. Um, it must come with divulging what they had done. It must come with an apology and repentance. It mustn't come with, I'm seeking forgiveness. It, the forgiveness comes from the person who was betrayed, not the betrayer. Mm -hmm. So they can't ask for forgiveness. They must be granted forgiveness. And I think that was quite an important sort of lesson that I, 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 that, that I found, is, is that, it, that, that, that forgiveness is about, um, you've got to earn your forgiveness and you can't ask for it. That was Jonathan Ansel speaking to Crema Media's Polity about betrayal, the secret life of apartheid spies.